Da, 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 da. Talk to a woman, the second episode. The series of interviews is a step that I'm taking. Um, the step to something unknown because I haven't ever taken non-scripted interviews before. So everything you had or not had an opportunity to see on Chinese TV in Real Kung Fu Experience was completely scripted. And uh, I would like to learn how to ask authentic questions from my heart, what I exactly want to know. And for this reason, I invite the people that I truly respect and look up to in art and uh, the philosophy of thought and uh, everything. Uh, guys, can you hear me well? Someone could you tell me if the sound is okay because sometimes we have a sound questions. Okay, cool. So very soon, my guest today is Philip Sahagen. It's I hope uh, I'm not uh, <laughs> butchering the name because I know and admire this person so much. And I never happened to announce his name. He is an international martial arts champion, and there's uh, so many championships and the variety of disciplines that um, he participated and won and showed extraordinary results. He, as well as a martial arts performer and choreographer, with an extensive career in Cirque du Soleil. Um, and another thing that is especially um, admirable for me. He is one of the first performers that worked with musical artists such as uh, Tina Turner, transforming a lot of martial movement into the level of musicality that is highly admirable. So he is about to join us. The time wise, it's coming. I'm doing very good. How are you doing, guys? Okay, Philip is here, so right now we are going to connect. Da -da -da -da. Da -da -da -da. It's working. Yes, I'm in the office. Nice, nice to see you, Philip. Thank you, likewise. How are you? Um, I'm very good and I'm excited because this is what I'm doing here. It's something very, very new for me. You know, I always wanted to learn how to ask the questions that are coming truly from my heart mm. and the things that I truly want to know from people like you, I had the people that I highly respect, uh, your work as well as your personality. Thank you so much. Super kind. So yeah, I've introduced you briefly to, um, to people yeah. just hmm? I'm gonna get a charger real fast I just realized okay but I could be I could be introducing you so uh, Philip is an, is an international um, martial arts champion and there's so many disciplines in which you showed incredible results so it's it would be a huge huge list um, it's not only wushu because my a competitive career is only in wushu, but for Philip is also in Kempo and in the variety of different styles and genres of martial arts, which is, which is very remarkable because it's so different for me uh, as a wushu performer, different disciplines absolutely don't feel natural to me. So I have a lot of admiration for those that also showed huge results in other disciplines. You also worked as a solo performer and the choreographer in Cirque du Soleil, right. um, creating uh, pieces. And there was a lot of fusion of what I've seen in your choreography, which is especially interesting to me because it's a combination of musicality and choreography. And uh, knowing that you have such a deep uh, traditional background 
it, it's especially, you know, interesting to see. Um, as well as I've already mentioned this before to people, um, you're one of the first performers that started to work with the martial movement and musicality with the musical artists and yeah. you work with Tina Turner, but then the very beginning of how you uh, incorporated the uh, traditional movement with the uh, pop, you know, right. music with the pop culture bringing very you I mean am I am I yeah. going the right direction because this sure. is fascinating to me and uh, I know that you were one of the first if not the very first person that have done it in the United States and I would like to emphasize on that because it's a it's a special it's a special thing to do something new and to do something new of that capacity on the big stage that's a big responsibility and that is a big risk. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> I found you're also, Philip is also a founder of K-Star Academy, right? It's a new school, a mentor, a father, and a visionary, and a man that I highly respect and have a lot of question for. So oh. welcome, Philip. <laughs> thank you so much, this woo woman. Very nice <laughs> to uh, have this interview and a nice chat. I consider not an interview, more like a chat with my old friend. Yes, definitely. It's so we met each other what early two thousands? I, I actually it's hard to say because we met also also the as I look back, it looks in my mind, it looks like a movie, right? So we met in Hollywood, that was one thing, you know, right. and now it's like a different reality and we also yeah. live in post apocalyptic world of right. coronavirus i yeah. mean i'm i'm just making a joke to uh not to belittle anybody's suffering in any means but just because it sucks to the point that i'm trying to use humor as a weapon right right well what what can you do right just try <laughs> to move on and, and uh, live your best life i mean it sucks for everybody that's when it first started hitting in the united states is the first thing i started to say is well other people are suffering so we might as well suffer together, you know, which is kind of a defeatist mentality at the front of it. But it's very the, stoic, I think. Yeah, yeah we just got to endure. And that's what we got to do. Like today in the morning, I trained my son as I'm holding my new baby. And then I trained just now two hours before this chat. And it feels good just to have that time to be a family and also kind of go back into the training side, which I missed personally. That's why I opened the new academy because I was missing it. You know, Philip, I was preparing for performing in Bercy, right? At the right. biggest arena in Paris. It's March, right? It was and already passed. Right? Yeah, it was supposed, supposed to, to be. Happen. Yes. Well, for now, it's changed for, for June 27th. Wow. Although, okay. as much as I don't want to be like pessimistic fatalist, I, I, I don't feel that it's going to happen. At, at, yeah, at this time. I, I'm not sure either. They say yeah, that, because it's 20 Southern Arena, you know, so it's... Yeah, that's a huge gathering. And then um, here in Cirque, we're supposed to be doing, uh, they say our shows might open in June, June 1st also. But we're very skeptical because Vegas is a tourism-based economy. So people, first, they open the big hotels and casinos. But second, people have to have the means to be able to travel uh, go to those casinos and then buy those tickets, which that's going to be an economic hardship that maybe won't happen for a while. So we'll, we'll see. We're also interested to see what's going to happen next. Mm -hmm. Well, Philip, I think you're the best person to speak about something that has been of my interest for so long. And I believe a lot of martial artists and people that are interested in martial arts would be very Fascinated to hear, you know, there's this um, endless fight between traditional martial artists, so people who follow a certain tradition, and people who um, train so-called uh, modern martial art. <clears throat> the, reason, the reason I say so-called, because, you know, the, it's, there, there is complexity there. Everything that's traditional and what's modern, it's also a very thin line. Right. Um, where do you stand in this? Because you are trained in traditional styles so extensively and so deeply. Although you are so good in mixing and fusing 
martial arts with different styles and music and being absolutely unapologetic and at the same time like clear about the vision that you have so in general the main thing i look at is ask yourself does your style restrict yourself so in the early age of training any kind of system you do have structure you have form right and within structure and form you usually have the basis of how do we grow and how do we build upon uh the scaffolding the the parameter that the skill is requiring right so in ballet you have the bar right and you have all the technique of the bar which i did ballet for two and a half years to train and improve my wushu too uh kickboxing has its own wushu has its own always within merit but then at the end of that going through that gamut of different things like okay are we seeking flexibility are we seeking power fluidity what what are we really trying to gain if we become a master of drills and not a master of freedom or in a way a type of self mastery where you can self express through the patterns that were learned then i think we've achieved something now the problem that i see with modern and with traditional is sometimes uh, the super new way of modern is very athletic and free free to the point where it's undisciplined authenticity they're like i'm doing what i feel like and i move as i feel like but at the same time to go back and do something that you're not good at maybe the modern will kind of shy away from in the old days as you know when we had the compulsory routines that yeah. was a little bit different i still caught a little bit in my teens of right. compulsory yeah so then they force you to say okay for instance in wushu you can jump high but now you have to land in the split or you mm-hmm. can do this but now you have to show us this uh, mobility even resting stance the mobility of the ankle or drop stance is enough to make most people have a hard time so oh definitely the, the wushu was interesting because it was designed i i teach this now when i tell people what's the use of the modern regardless of the historical creation of how it became because a lot of traditionalists are mad about that part we exactly <laughs> look that it made a, a road map to create high level athletes quickly and so mm-hmm. in, in that parameter we just saying that wushu as a discipline has its necessity because it's created a method to take a person from this level to that level in a specific period of time uh, and through the duanwei system of of kind of just testing out like here 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 and here here's where you are and here's where you should be now traditional forms often times are very short and they're done for a different reason like okay we say combat or whatever is the purpose mm-hmm. but realistically traditional martial arts about gong fa right and that's yes. instead of building gong if you don't have gong fa then you don't have technique and if you focus only technique you don't have freedom right so yes. gong fa builds limitless technique but if you practice technique numbers you're limited to be, to never become free so instead it, it, anyways it's a, it's a weird web but the short answer is they're both wheels of a cart that need to move together exactly and realistically when you're seeing like a, i'm sure you've seen the animal flow the movie yeah. man i can't stand it sometimes because it's just reinventing the wheel you know now the bjj it's funny with the quarantine i've seen uh bjj people basically doing forms they're doing mm-hmm. ka- or taolu now and they're over there teaching their students like oh what are you doing this and i like, oh doesn't that look like taiji now it looks very mm-hmm. close and uh i think that there needs to be a little more friendship and harmony i don't i don't think they are following the structure though you know what i mean like the the geometry right um i have a feeling but this is my personal opinion because i like to do the free form as you know you know right 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 um right. i like to keep the structure you know i like to keep integrity to my jiban gong you know to my to my foundation so no matter no matter how how wild i want to go emotionally i would i still like to keep the integrity of geometry right so for instance in uh, my personal training i have the forms or the the things that i train and i don't show people that that's mm-hmm. for me then i have the things that i train to show people 
maybe that's like a wow thing or something that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, e even it's something I might be working on, but maybe I just show one thing. Like there's one soft form that I've been performing or doing for about 12 years, uh, oh, wow. maybe, maybe more. And uh, besides that, then I have the bull whip, right? Which is the flash in the pan, like really expressive thing. But beyond that, the martial art for yourself sometimes is a completely different category that we need to use to unlock the puzzle of, of our own movement and expression, right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, we, had, we had an interesting comment there. They say, you got to ask yourself, what are you doing martial arts for? And I can ask that I don't think I'm doing martial arts for something. I don't consider myself doing martial arts. I consider myself being martial arts. Ooh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like not conceited at all, right? <laughs> no, you are martial arts. That's why it's Wu woman. Yeah, but you know that Wu is not for Wushu. Wu is for Wu Zetian, for Chinese queen. She wow. was like super vigilant. And her story was very interesting how, of how she got herself on the throne. And it's also like, it's also a multi-layered story because, you know, there's a lot of things that are not easy to grasp by the modern mind oh. but she was also the first woman that gained such power and there was a golden time at the at, at the certain part of her being on the throne so I who is for that story. that sounds nice you, you didn't know that her name uh, again wu zetian wu w u uh, z e tian was this the woman that um was a pirate at some point in china no <laughs> you know no, her no no yeah. I, I know that one. I don't remember the name. She's quite something. I don't want to butcher the name of uh, right. uh, another one. But um, Wu Zetian is actually a very famous uh, figure. They also had a TV show, uh, drama TV show, where Fan Bingbing played uh, Wu Zetian. Although, although I never imagined Wu Zetian looking like Fan Bingbing, though. So, I, like, in, term, in terms of there was a different vibe. Like, I thought that she would be, like, something different though fun mm -hmm. being did a great job you know right. yeah sure i mean she's in everything she's a crazy artist so for you martial arts you feel like you are martial arts at this point it's just one with your life yeah i think so because because when i when i even not when if i think of me doing something mm -hmm. it means it's very easy to stop doing it because right. um one day you don't want to do something. You don't, you know what I mean? You, you, you don't want to read a certain book or listen to a mu certain music or talk to a person that you enjoyed talking yesterday. Be this is when you're looking at the things from the perspective of doing. Sure. But if you think about, uh, about the things from the perspective of being, you know, when I wake up, I'm entering the conscious being, right? So I'm not asleep. <clears throat> and if we suggest that I'm being martial arts, there is no way for me to not do martial arts. So would you say that you're a, um, a wusher, you know? Maybe, I would, right? I would say, yes. That type of mentality, right? Yes, I would say yes. Yeah, I think uh, that's a fair yeah. statement. So right now, um, on my ends, I've kind of been uh, digesting and accepting the fact that even on paper and by truth, I'm a third generation martial artist. So my grandfather practiced and was not formal martial arts in say the Eastern uh, viewpoint, but he was a Western boxer. So mm -hmm. he was a pugilist who actually fought uh, and had feature fights in Mexico. I've seen the ticket, it's like the year 1940 something. <laughs> And uh, when I look at that lineage and I look at my son, who's now wanting to practice, although I'm really shy about training the kid, he's like, Daddy, I want to learn this new form and this, and this, and this. And I go, well, this has really become a martial arts lineage in a way and a lifestyle. So even when I decide to, like my wife sometimes says, because she, okay, so back it up. My wife is a contortionist with Cirque, mm -hmm. right? And she's been with Cirque for 25 years, consistently performing. So for her, she's the longest running performer in a single discipline in the company. But also for her, her Amazing. discipline itself is based off, hey, this is what I have to do for a job, right? 
Mm. So when I stopped performing for Cirque, she kind of asked me, well, why are you still training? Like, you're not going to be on stage right now. So why go and run or stretch or do this and that? And I really had no answer other than that's my lifestyle now. Well, it's because you're being martial arts. Right. I like to get up and move around. And even if I didn't do anything the entire day, it might be like 11 o'clock at night and I can't sleep and I need to go downstairs and I need to do some kind of movement, you know? And when mm -hmm. I do that movement, I feel better and I can sleep, you know? Um, I have a question. You mentioned your son. How mm -hmm. becoming a father uh, influenced um, your philosophy of movement, if, if it had some influence? It's trying to be kinder now. You try to be kinder. In my young years of training, I was training from a place of self-contempt. I wasn't really happy with myself and who I was. So I wanted to become better than what I already uh, perceived myself as being, right? So wherever I thought I was, I want to be greater. So I consummation more things. And in a way, it was done in, in a uh, probably non-healthy version, right? So yeah. now I look at it. And that's I can relate. I, that's when I started to leave competition and I decide, well, I want to become a performer. Because I want to be able to express and still getting judged. You do get judged, but it's in a more distant way. But also at the same time, the joy was there that competition didn't bring. Because originally I was training Wushu because I was hoping it would be an Olympic. Now they had the Olympic tournament. I remember <laughs> 2008. I mean, look, come on. I think, I think Wushu deserved and still deserves so much more than what it was. Right. So when I heard that that was coming, I was like, forget that. No way. And then uh, I ended up going on tour with Tina Turner at the same time. Now, by that time, I could do like almost every Nandu pretty much mm -hmm. without trying. That was training for that purpose. And when that fell, you still have to find the joy. And for me, that was definitely the performance and the, the lifestyle aspect of it. Just getting up. No one's around. And do your movement. You know what I think? I think you, you on stage with the martial movement and Tina Turner had had so much more evolutionary rep and revolutionary impact on martial arts than if you went to the tournament. You're really kind. I, I think um, that was an interesting concept because shortly after, in that same concert year or within the following year when we were in Europe, Britney Spears already came out with Tricker slash Ninjas on her tour, as did Madonna mm -hmm. following Britney. So that was pretty yeah. crazy. It was a pop, pop year for ninjas. <laughs> uh, you never then, know, you know. You yeah, sent this. Pop you pop you sent this uh, message, you know, to to, to the universe. Yeah, well, to thank you. yeah, to, to people observed and you know. The simple thing is now you ask the question as a father. How does how, how do I feel? So rather than moving with a lot of, uh, I try to move with a soft power which is a bit different mm -hmm. type of expression, you know. Philip, I think, can you hear me okay? Because I think your audio is a little. Uh, Philip, can you hear me? And if others can say if they, they can hear me. No? Okay, let me see what can be done. Can anybody hear me now? No? It's like this? Okay, right now everybody says that they can hear me and not Philip. Shall... Okay. We're gonna be back, guys. Okay.
Can anybody hear me? The technical joys of doing something live. So I'm connecting to Philip, and I hope it works this time. Restart. It works. And everybody is back on our live stream, which is nice. That's great. Thank you very much, everyone, for bearing with me. I get text messages. People are like, turn on your mic. Yeah? <laughs> There's no mic. It's built in. <laughs> okay, Philip, I have a practical question that I hope may help somebody who is starting their performance career in martial arts or starting... Uh, you know, media creation with martial arts. Um, where is this thin line where the tricks are impressive or the technique is, okay, tricks versus technique. Okay, let's, let's, let's call it like this. What this do you is... think? What's your take on that as a choreographer, as a performer? Because, you know, I also, I'm also into tricks and I also injured the hell out of myself. <laughs> so I'll share my take on that, and I would like to hear your professional and personal take on that. My professional take is I always wanted to book a job without doing any jumps. And Great. I've, done <laughs> <laughs> I've been able to do that two times. There was two times that I was able to do that. And the first time uh, was done out of arrogance, and the second time was done out of necessity. So the first time, um, it was a commercial audition in Los Angeles and there's a bunch of ninjas who are all of my variety because that's the casting one of that look and so we're all lined up we're all wearing the same black shirt whatever and I'm hearing them go into the casting room one by one and I'm listening and I hear the and I almost know like up oh, 540 kick okay up oh, he did a flash kick uh, and you hear the weapon they're going in there with so you kind of know so by the time I went up, I heard about four people do the martial arts. You, you so heard hush, 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 yeah? Oh, I heard it. Yes, I yeah. heard it. And I almost can see in my mind, like, especially the airtime, like you hear the, and then you hear that, which is the dropping of the yeah. body. Of the floor. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, that's a 540 for sure. Different. So I went in there and uh, uh, I remember saying, you know, I could do some chop, chop, jump, jump, but I felt like you saw a lot of that already. So instead, mm -hmm. so then I ended up with soft type of form mixed with some, and then at the end, everyone was like, whoa. And then one guy was a skeptic, but he was like, but can you handle weapons? Because I came in there empty handed and I'm like, well, actually... I'm a mm -hmm. weapons expert, but it's my specialty, right? Not the empty hand. So then they ended up giving me a, a golf club or something, something ridiculous. <laughs> so I ended up doing like movements with the club and I booked the job. And I remember thinking, wow, that's the first time where I didn't have to throw myself on the ground, do any flips on my head, do any crazy things. And it felt great because to me, human expression always trumps flash. Right? Mm -hmm. And if, if you can express acrobatics with a human storytelling component, then it's higher level. So I was talking to a power tumbler, for instance. Yes, saying, this is also artistic enlightenment. Right. So in, in a jump, let's say, I was talking to a Cirque power tumbler and I said, when you approach the round off, what's happening between the distance between your starting point and the point of the round off? like the punch. Uh, so they do their, their step. And they said, well, I just run. And I said, well, I want you to think if you're running, are you running to close the distance on something or are you running to run away from something? And just from that emotional change in energy, if you're running away from something, you'll tend to be lighter. If you're running towards something, you tend to be heavier and the pressure magnifies. So if I'm running away in my mind, here is a surprising type of a flip. Mm -hmm. Here's a pressurized flip, meaning I'm building anticipation. 
uh, anticipation. So, so the same directive action changes with the artistic intention of the performer. And when you can go into that level, I think it starts to become storytelling and interesting. So what is martial arts today? I had this talk with people because coming from a more traditional background and from a family that was into fighting and this, this whole concept, it was hard for me to accept the first time someone uh, asked me, well, you're a black belt. Show me your backflip. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, mm -hmm. I had no idea because my, my black belt comes from a karate system. Mm -hmm. And it was a karate that was not a modern karate. So there was no tornado kick. There was no backflip. But this is the age of like Power Rangers had just come out and everything was ninja crazy. Mm -hmm. And they really expected that. And for a while, I held out and actually did not do a backflip until I was about 20 years old. Same. I held out. First backflip I did like I did. 24. Wow. Well, you beat me then. That's late. <laughs> so. Well, I've never, I'm, I wasn't interested in black, in right. like backflip, but then I competed <laughs> with in Nantran and then. Right. I needed to I needed to score enough in Nandu. So right. you know, so there is a Tenkun and then into backflip. You know, yeah. it, it it I need it, it was a it was a easier to score than jump to five hundred forties, you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah. For me, I, had to back flip. I hate backflip, but I had to do it. And mm -hmm. then the backflip uh, yeah, someone says unnecessary. It's true. <laughs> but let's look at it this way. But let's look at it this way. If you're scared of it and if you have an aversion to it, then there's probably mm -hmm. something there. And if you're physically capable of doing it and you lack discipline and training and your your aversion is fear based, then it might be something you should consider embracing. Even though it might exactly. be something that you don't ever take to the stage. And that's that's how I make my artistic choices. And it's also relatively safe, you know. Yeah, I think it's safer than people. than John T in the in the split, you know. It is. By so far, the mechanics are easier. Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Both of us worked in China. Um, yeah. It's the whole other universe in terms of the conditions of work, which is not exactly what you know what my question is because the answer is easy. It sucks. So <laughs> my, <laughs> my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is more about oh, understanding yeah, a... of shu in wushu, you know, because there is yishu and wushu, right? right? Yishu oh, yes. is a non-combat art and wushu is warrior, military, police, all this, this character is used to, to say that. Um, you also have an extensive career of working in the United States. You know, I'm just starting in the United States. So for me, there's a, a lot of experience here in China and then a little bit in the Western cult countries to compare. It's not a life, lifelong, like for you. So how do you balance what, how do you like, what is the main difference in the feeling for you? Because here, most people don't even know about the phenomena of Yishu and Wushu, you know? I think that what I experienced in the States, at least on the idea of let's go do some commercials or let's film something, is just, yes, can you do the jumps? Can you do a couple flashy kicks? Because for them, it is a superficial-based art form, and they want it to be a physical, they a lot to dance. So, for instance... You know that if you do a form full out and you have intent behind it, you can't really do a form for an hour if it's a, exter a more external type of a form. Ex but maybe you oh, yeah. It's a very hour. short, I think. And the I, I can't. I think I can last a minute. That's great. That's a yeah. long time for, <laughs> for really explosive, right? Most people yeah. do it, and I try to explain I had to explain it, uh, you mentioned Tina Turner, I had to explain it there, I had to explain it at Cirque, I had to explain it everywhere I go, it's like, look, if you want it to look aggressive and look strong, keep in mind that we're generating energy, whether you want to believe in chi or not. Let's just talk about the Western side. Okay, mm -hmm. let's just call it manics or kinetic motion, kinetic energy, right? If I make this movement with my and punch, 
if my energy moves correctly, it should leave my body, right? Mm -hmm. We know that. Kick, I punch, that leaves my body, and the kinetic energy yes, makes it. Yes, project. You project it. It makes a connection, and then that impact should damage my opponent or stop a fight, whatever it is. Basically, you think a KO is you're literally shutting off another human being, which is mm -hmm. crazy to have that kind of uh, focus and power. But when no one's in front of you, and you still have to generate that type of power, you you usually don't get it back if you have the wrong type of breathing technique, the wrong type of rhythm, right? You just yeah. constantly expel, expel, expel. And so breathing content on the Western side, giving time to breathe, which doesn't usually happen. Sometimes it's just like, go, go, go. That's why people complain, choppy, uh, choppy different things. Oh, wait, hold on. Someone said chi is pseudoscience. Ooh, I think Ooh, I got <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> this is not the best place to say that. <laughs> I understand your thoughts, sir, because I've been the skeptics too. But what level are we talking about? And I, we can go back to that later, but I'll finish this question. So in the West, it's usually very superficial. Let me see that 540 kick, that 720, whatever, the corkscrew round. And if you want to get a job, you probably should look to do that straight up. If you want to be young and get a job, that's probably more important. But when you're talking about martial art as a whole and representing it, yes, you need the acceptance of the artistic side of the physicality to understand why. The storytelling is very important. So the old story of uh, Jet Li and Once Upon a Time in China, right? And Jet Li in the 90s was doing a lot of string work. You recall those films, I'm sure. And he complained to Troy Hark and he complained to Corey Yuen and he says, I'm doing this too much. People see that I have some sort of skill if I keep relying on technology to make myself look better. And their response was, if it's done correctly in the concept of the film, now we can argue that some is ridiculous anyways, but if it's done correctly in the concept of the film, people will suspend belief for that moment to view something spectacular mm -hmm. because they believe in you and they believe in that moment and it deserves something spectacular. So in that way, you're using it sparingly versus in the wuxia style where you just kind of go and everything's crazy right off the bat. It's more like you have to be ready for that. And it's funny because mm -hmm. people, people accept it more when they sit down for a superhero film. But when they watch a kung fu film, some people get turned off. And I honestly do a little bit uh, where people are flying around right away. But... But I think I it's a little bit of a different reason, you know, for ex right. especially right. Shanghai 60s, that cinema, right? So they used a lot of artistic hyperbolization, you know, like, like in literature. Yeah. To, like to, 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 to add the spectacular effect. And also the way the fights were constructed, they were constructed like mini segments of storytelling within the motion. Right. And they're beautiful. Like, they are beautiful. It seems like they were not constructed to look real in terms sure. of yeah, violence. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think yeah. so, you know? Different type of art. And what, I, what I've said is if you're a fan of the super genre, which I'm not, and I'm sorry, I just can't really same. Same. get into same. that. Yeah, Marvel, sorry. I see a, a dude logged in that I know loves it, but I'm sorry, sir. But if you're watching the wuxia genre, Basically, what we're saying is this person didn't get bit by a radioactive spider. This person didn't drop from space. You know how they got that way? And dedication, right? They trained yes. very hard to supernatural potential. And from wire. Sure. <laughs> but you don't got to ruin that for me. I want to believe that I meditated for 10 years in the cave supernatural skills. Or one or uh, two. Whoever. You know, even, even, the, even the idea of a wire actually excites me. Sure. Because to okay. perform it with the wire, there's still a supernatural skill that you need to develop, you know, to it have is. the rhythm and it the beauty so of hard. flying up and landing, especially to do it with someone else as a part of the choreography. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have some that, people I commenting. It's interesting. If you've never been hoisted, hoisted up in one of those wires, guys, try it. It's quite difficult just to perform a Philip, I can't hear you again. 
Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. I think. No. Mm -mm. Yes, it's like this. Guys, come back to us. I'm going to reboot it again. Okay, I'm back. And I hope you guys will be back as well because it's such an interesting it's such an interesting conversation that we're having here. And um the connection is actually I don't know. It's always when when there's a a very interesting conversation there is a okay philip is here he is joining us waiting for philip to join yeah look philip i think i'm going to get a new i think it's now. because it's so interesting I think it's because the conversation is really interesting and people keep following and again re-entering the live stream you know so I really appreciate that. that and at and you know it's actually proves the point that when there is a true conversation with people like us because we were like really passionate about it for so long you know it's like we went into all of the deepest de depths as it was possible and Uh when I was rebooting all of that what came to my mind is um do you feel that it's possible that um the genre of this fuse fusion of the genre of uh, wuxia and uh, the modern um stage or you know live action in the way that could be understood by the western world Okay, understood. I I need to clarify what I mean by understood by the western world, right? Okay, Kung Fu Panda, right? Yeah. It's a very westernized Chinese story and it makes it beautiful because Kung Fu Panda it's very China. It has so many principles that are so fundamental not to martial arts but to the whole culture. It's like a manual right. to friendship according to Chinese culture. It's like a manual to daily things. That's what it is to me. And at the same time, it has a beautiful message that is understandable from the western standpoint, right? So this is the beacon right. of something super Chinese, super traditional makes it to the modern world. and becomes understandable dissectable from this perspective so what do you think about my question you know usha with the modern more than with the modern stage or live action manifestation of that do you think it's possible to manifest in this reality sometime after we're out of the virus <laughs> yeah uh seeing the um so you know about run yes yeah, ob so obviously right okay. do you know that run close i i do i i've heard you know i i follow i support i know you choreographed for that you know and i met mark in los so, angeles uh, well, yes did. okay yeah so mark uh, one of my students <laughs> yeah well look of But, course uh, i i looked and you know It's a beautiful piece of work. Well, of course, I know of its existence, yeah. But I would say this, when we were trying to do run, and I was lucky because basically right before the creation process, I injured myself. I broke a, a bone mm -hmm. in my leg, right? I was up for one of the quote-unquote leading roles, either a lead or a lead bad guy, so hero or a bad yeah. guy. And uh anyways breaking my leg reporting that to casting they were still considering trying to bring me in to like how bad is it 
are you seriously on crutches? Or how broken is it? I'm like, it's broke. And uh, when we were there, they actually said, well, we want to create some dynamic action. But the problem that I saw was it actually was not fantasy enough because with run, they wanted everything to be super realistic, uh, which on a stage... It's very hard to know, even use the word realistic in the context of the stage and martial movement of this genre, I think. All right. Because let's say, for instance, and the, the crew did a fantastic job, but I felt like for a lot of the creative process in this particular project, my hands were tied because there was other people above me who were dictating how action should be made, mm -hmm. right? When you're watching on stage, for instance, just to sell a punch to the face, how difficult is that to, to sell for the entire audience? Not only that, but in this particular show, there were scenes where the, the uh, cast was fighting in the audience so how are you going to sell realistic hits right there in the audience safely night after night it's very challenging very difficult yes. right so i think that a brand such as cirque or a brand as in there's another one called dragon this type of company if they were to embrace a more wuxia style coupled with the circus component they would be more successful because I think the gritty realism of it is not necessarily what people are looking to see on stage. They want to see something to suspend reality for them. Don't moment. in order to do that, technology and human performance is necessary. I have a question. Do you think it's because culturally, um, Western society is more used to watching martial arts as, you know, boxing or a scene from the movie where people got out of the bar and they're smashing each other's faces versus uh, in China as an opera where martial movement is an element of storytelling amongst other things. Right. I think that is definitely a component because there's, there's two huge cultures of different types of martial arts, you know? And even in, in Japan, what they consider the almost ritualized version of martial arts, like when they're doing kenjutsu, uh, let's say different techniques against each other, you can see how it's so beautiful, but so highly uh, dictated yes. and choreographed, right? At the same time, they have and expression then, though. Sometimes I'm watching and I'm like, how can you be so limited, but project so much energy emotional energy like with it's not that easy you know that's a, a term they call it sophisticated simplicity mm. the simpler the movement the harder it is to express and that's why i think that that in its own way is a high high level of martial movement for sure because there's a saying that if you take one posture well then it should be as if you trained your entire life like people Say in taking one posture, you can express the entire depth of your art. I agree with that. Which, uh, which is uh, interesting. And actually, there's an old fable or story of, uh, related to that, where in Japan, in the samurai era, a big samurai bumped into a farmer as uh, they were crossing on the road. And the samurai become offended. And at that time, you know, they could behead a person on the spot uh, because they had that type of status over a quote-unquote common person, mm -hmm. right? And... Uh, but he said to make it a public thing. And he said, you know what? You've insulted me by bumping into me and my sword. And I'm going to see you here on this date. And I'm going to duel with mm. you and make a, a show. With you. So the story goes that then the, the person felt horrible and he couldn't believe it. And he knew that he was going to face death without a doubt in his mind. He was going to die on that day. So the only thing that he did is he went back to his farm and he grabbed the old stick and he practiced a single posture that he would believe would be the posture that at least if he was to be cut down, he would be cut down in a gracefully, position. graceful ending. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So he took this position and I don't know what it was because it's not the nature of the story to say which posture it was. But the story goes that when this person drew the sword in front of the, the samurai, the samurai looked upon him and actually saw that this person had no fear of death. And that this person, regardless of if he was a proper warrior or not, had reached a high level 
in his understanding of life because he had come to accept death, which for a samurai was one of the stones of their enlightenment Definitely. journey because they were constantly in that world where death was everyday common occurrence. So with that being said, the swordsman drew back his sword, sheathed the sword, and pardoned the person, saying, it's my mistake. I didn't know that you're a person of this level. You know, so it, it, it serves an interesting story, but yet, on the West... This is powerful. We Thank you for sharing someone, that. Would we want to watch someone just draw a sword and take a position in a Marvel film? Probably not. Unless it was done in a very different way, but we need the whole story to understand the power of that posture. And to be able to look at that person as a human being and even beyond a human being as a living thing at that point. And you're seeing that force comes not just from self, right? It comes from many other factors depending on what school or what, where you decide to pull your energy from. And I think that that person on that day was more than just the, themselves. They were greater than that, life and death. I believe that what it comes down to it's such a multi-layered topic, but I think it comes down to the art form being highly nuanced. It's like a classical music that is a highly nuanced right. music. And you're hearing the symphony and every time. Mm -hmm. I would be interested in a classical Western because they were kind of doing that because the Western was inspired by Japanese cinema, they mm -hmm. said, right? face-off and those postures and people were getting ready to draw their gun similar to like when the swordsmen drew their sword and they were in those uh, uh, stationary actually positions. i never thought about ready, it but... it's, it's a very interesting a very interesting comparison you know well there's a, a large yeah concept and dichotomy there between the the western you know that even the seven samurai the very classic western film inspired the magnificent seven mm -hmm. which was a famous western retelling of that story which there were seven cowboys versus seven samurai saving a town uh, because the director was a f big fan of Akira Kurosawa, mm -hmm. who was a, a director. Yeah, 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 I know Akira Kurosawa. This is fascinating. Right. Well, Philip, this is such a pleasure that we, you know, had an opportunity to speak about all of it. You see how many people engaged and, you know, three times where we were cut off and everybody is back, you know? Thank I you, have a question. You. Do, you want to huh? okay. do you want to aggress the chief? Do I, well, you know what? Let's do it. Let's go. Chief, oh, you know, huh? so, you wanna, well, you, wanna... you start, I will jump in. Because I don't know from which part to start. From spiritual or from scientific or from medical. I start, I start okay. logic. Yeah. Because when people have to start on logic school. And one thing that I like is um, I've been blessed because I've had multiple teachers, right? But each of the teachers has a different speaking mm -hmm. style. One was science school, maybe one is spiritual or religious school, one is health, one is combat. So with that being said, I'm blessed to be able to at least choose different Well, ways this is what I started. I said, like, I don't know from which to start, to speak spiritually, to speak wellness, or to speak, you know, uh, or to speak uh, older systems, I not to call it religion, if I would be referring to Tao. So, you know. Right. Okay, so let's just start with this. For the skeptic out there, Chi, and I was definitely skeptic still, but we have to first look at it from a practicality standpoint. Practicality, first of all, what is Chi for you? If you look at Chi in the old character of Chinese system, Actually, you have rice and you have rain. Mm -hmm. You have two things, rice and rain, which means that's already a cycle of energy, one of the water body of rain, nourishing the earth, which then gives rice. But within that, and you have, um, within just that, you have an idea of the logic of qi. So now we move forward to a little bit different understanding. Qi has more than one type. It's not projecting chi fireballs and different things as such. We start with the fact that in Chinese, there's something called kong chi, mm -hmm. right? And there's a kong tiao. <laughs> kong chi is the yeah. air, the air that you breathe. So for us on the Western side, 
we call this the oxygen carbon exchange when we're breathing in and breathing out. As we know, we're breathing in what the plants are quote unquote breathing out and vice versa. There's a cycle there between environment and human being. So with that being said, China acknowledges that. And that is one form of qi, kong qi, right? Now, if we have other type of qi, qi from food, from the environment. We have chi from social interaction. We have chi that's a supernatural kind of uh, chi. These are the main types of chi we deal with on an everyday basis. But what's the supernatural chi, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say this, Snickers commercial. Are you you when you're hungry? <laughs> if you have too much chi from food, right? And your chi goes away from the food, you may be weak on the other aspects of your life, such as regenerating the quote unquote yin and yang cycle through sleeping or meditation. So bad sleep, no breakfast. How does that affect the quality of your life? Well, the study of qi gong, the, the qi kind of the skill set of using qi or developing qi teaches us that if we don't have good sleep, if we cannot consume food, we should still should be able to access other dimensions of energy beyond these yes. two. Which is from the Shaolin school and don't know too much about the Taoist school, but you have this idea of fasting. You have that idea. So we take away the food. Now what's going to happen to you? you now you're forced. Now live. you're forced to exercise other yeah. avenues. Well, you have to learn how to use the other things. Now we're going to do sleep deprivation, meaning we're going to meditate more, sleep less, maybe only three to four hours of sleep. Oh my God, now what? But every day you still have to do the same. Okay, fasting, right? Sleep deprivation. Now maybe isolation. Mm -hmm. Some people freak out right now. They're like, I can't Solitude, do anything. I'm right. freaking it's, out. It's one of the fundamental practices. Right. So if you're looking at that, some of my friends need social interaction. If you force them to stop talking, they just collapse. They lose all their power. But we should be able to have power in silence and in speech, right? There are two different types. One is yin, one is yang. Also, they say we have to balance it out. So from that just simple logical perspective, let's say that we learn to economize our life, meaning we economize our diet. Let's say as a vehicle, we're a lean, mean fighting machine, and we don't need much to operate because we are at the level of a Tesla car or something versus a diesel truck. So the food we're consuming is already different, all yeah. right? And now let's say the knowledge that we're listening to through our ears also gives us a type of a, you know, are you consuming junk food in the brain or not? If your brain is like a computer and you leave a lot of windows open, just like your computer, a lot of things running at the same time, the battery drains, which is your chi, your life force is also draining. So instead you compartmentalize or get rid of as much excess thought and operate on a more clear, singular, authentic thought. For instance, a child, I see something, I like something that moves, something else, attention. The child will rarely carry A, B, C, D, all into their mind and then roll through mm -hmm. life. This is why it becomes much more tired than a kid. So qigong and qi practice starts with learning how to economize all the different types of energy in our life system so that we can improve the quality of life. That's the first From that, that Yes, we have health school. So that's more dealing with health school. You have martial school, which gathers, and then you have the spiritual school, which is doing that for a higher awareness of human potential. And some even say immortality, different types of things and unlocking supernatural potential, which is where people usually get the most amount of flack is when we talk about supernatural potential, but simply saying like this, if an athlete does a really good training plan, diets well, does everything well, social interaction is on point, cutting out negativity in their life, and they can break the mile. Meaning in the past, when people thought that you couldn't break, I think they, they thought 
seven minute mile couldn't happen or was, was it six minute mile? One of those mile markers is like, no one's gonna break it. And then once someone broke it, wasn't that like having supernatural ability too? And once that supernatural ability became the norm, many other people break it to the point where now it's standard. So when we're looking for the next potential of us as human beings, people who work with chi and practice with chi, simply saying, economizing and developing the energies in our system, we're looking for the next level of our human potential. So I hope that helps address the chi. It was really absolutely masterfully articulated in such a short span of time and you also very very masterfully touched upon so many layers of this and you know that well, that you. that was truthfully brilliantly explained i don't even want to add anything because it's it's perfect it's just it's just well, thank perfect you, so, yeah thank you thank you for this i believe that this is a you know, it's your gift to, to this reality and to people that are listening now and then have an opportunity to listen and recording because it's a, it's a lifetime of contemplation to put this into words so masterfully. Um, mm. And I have, a, I have a, one of the final questions. Um, okay. I used to ask ever since I was very young, I used to ask people what they would say to their younger self. And recently I stopped being interested in that because I start to be interested in what would you say to your future self from now? Oh, I don't know. That's an interesting concept. The future mm -hmm. self, huh? Eh, what would you say to your future self? Uh, I thought, I think about it a lot. Sometimes, in fact, today I was uh, riding a bicycle and I was uh, thinking about it. I would say that my dear future self, uh, dear Svetlana, I'm doing everything at the maximum of my current understanding of my present reality. I am truthfully doing my best because I, I know myself and I know the pattern of self. Now I want to ask you, do you think your future self would need to hear that? That's a good question. That's a good question. Knowing myself that I like to hear everything from my future and present and, and uh, past selves, I like to imagine the existence of all of it at the same time, because I truthfully believe that there's the, the reality isn't linear. Uh, human life has the feeling of leniency because we have the point of birth and the point of death, right? But at the same time, I feel our future present and the past are existing in clusters that are, are like stuck on one another. So sure. I believe, believe, I, I won't say I know, I believe that my future self would love to hear from me. Good. <laughs> <laughs> For me, I don't know. Um, because like I mentioned briefly, my training changed a lot. And it started for a point of not being happy with who I was. And then there's a point of contentment. And even now being married and being with kids, I go, well, all training is in preparation of life and living life to the best way possible, right? So even if I never was to throw another punch in my life, the training that I underwent serves to support my life as it is today. Because it is become me. Without a doubt, I know that because I have lost function of a leg or lost function of my spine, I know that I still have martial arts with me. So even if I cannot move, it's been consumed and digested. You are martial arts, you but see? I, We're coming full circle to the but, first point. But I feel like the past me, the present, and possibly the future me all exist at the same time, which is strange, but it's simple like this. 
A, if you have memory of the past, you can go back and you can talk to that person. And uh, we'll just say that first. Second, if someone has interacted with you from the past and they hold you in memory, you're still living as a past version, right, for that person. So for instance, even in celebrity, you're watching a music video, you're watching a concert or whatever it is, an interview from the past. And if you recall it well, that's the image that you put in your mind of that person, mm -hmm. right? I visited the Czech Republic probably two years ago. I hadn't been for about five years and people greeted me and they're like, oh, Philip, Philip. And they said, um, did you go and do this? And did you go and do that? And I looked at them and I said, was I supposed to do those things? <laughs> and they said, well, you were going to, you said. And I was like, oh, I guess I didn't. Because my life had changed. My life had turned. But in their mind, they remembered the Philip from five years ago when I actually already forgot that person. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in my life, I've actually met people from like junior high school or something. I cannot remember them. Which is crazy because I don't think I was traumatized, but I definitely moved, I moved away from it in a way where I lived those years for sure. And I don't advert those years, but it changed into something else. Now the future, Philip, is like the one that says, I will do this. I know my intention of where I'm going. I know that what my action is generating, mm -hmm. right? is a certain karma flow. So for instance, if I decide to follow through three gates, because I do believe that humans have a choice to dictate some factors yes, of their yes, life, same. right? There's Yuan Fen, there's Yuan yes. Fen. And actually when I was 17, it was funny. My first master says, you know, you're a person with a lot of Yuan Fen. And he's like, I'm going to name you Yuan Yang, which is my first Chinese name, Yuan Yang. Uh, Philip, I think we need just in case to clarify what is Yuan Fen. Yuan Fen in direct translation means uh, destiny, or I would say more serendipitous right. than destiny. In the context yeah, of Chinese language, great, it yeah. would be destiny. In the context of if we were speaking English, we would say serendipitous, right? Yes, I think that's a very accurate Yeah, just so they, not everybody so speaks Chinese in, here, so. Right. Great, great, great. So when I was 17 and training uh, early years in China, my first master looked upon me and said, uh, I believe you possess a lot of your friend. Like you have this uh, thing in mm -hmm. you that you continuously uh, bump into things. I Definitely. And, and I think it manifests it, in your shanfa. Oh, okay. So when we were doing uh, interaction with people, it was ironic that that master, out of all the people I could have bumped into China, a few years later, probably six, uh, no, three years later, 2006 or seven-ish, he uh, moved to America in LA very close oh, to wow. me. And I was able to train more with this individual. And actually I continuously went back to their school. Uh, similar things with even like you, uh, Jackie Chan company, for instance, I randomly became just an extra in Rush Hour mm -hmm. 3. Then the following year, the Jackie Chan Disciple TV show in China. And then I stayed in contact and, and we did a recent training with the stunt team. And then uh, just by happenstance, I got to be invited to one of Jackie's films, Project X, and work a week or two Hap in there. Yeah. And I was like, from 2000... Well, it's also culture. It's also the culture of Guangxi. Uh, right. So for those yes. that are watching, uh, the phenomenon of Guanxi in Chinese, so the, the term itself in direct translation means relationship. But it goes much deeper than that. The idea of Guanxi is probably the strongest vehicle of making things happen in China. Am I correct for saying that? Sure. I think that's right. On the simple side, I try to people, uh, I try to tell people to think it's like social currency. Oh, Philip, it's, it's kind of a funny thing, but I was in, I, to be honest, I don't remember on which, I don't remember which one of those. So it's a film studio an hour away from Shanghai because there, there are several of them. And Hengdian? yes, Hengdian, Hengdian, right? 
Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was at one of the dinners, the Guanxi related dinners. And I remember yeah. that one of the action directors actually was showing me your way scene. And he was like, do you know him? I'm like, oh, yeah. I yes. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, knowing, knowing just visually, because I know that you can visualize me sitting in the middle of nowhere, because, you know, Haydian is pretty isolated, you know, like a district. And there's like a small district with the, a, a couple of places to eat, you know, and they also look like uh, Chinese small places to eat, right? Uh, and imagine me right, sitting right. there surrounded by a bunch of things, you know, um, and, and, and then somebody introduces like, do you know this gentleman? And this is you, you know, it is so interesting that it's like referring to what you just said. At that moment, I visited you in whatever dimension of time you resided at that time. But I was in the middle of nowhere in China. Right. That's crazy, yeah. huh? The way that we the past, the present, the future version. I, well, I, I think I, so. Uh, it, it is, actually, it is beautiful. It's, it, we, we were speaking about storytelling. And then imagine that we're right. constantly living the multidimensional, multilayered, beautiful story. Only if we are capable of registering it. Definitely. Sometimes I, I think... And before, when I couldn't drive, even when I was young, you're looking at the passenger window outside of mama or dada's car. <laughs> and you look at the people in their car and you're just like, well, they're in their perfect, perfect bubble. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they have their own life, their own worries, their own loves. But if our cars were to bump or simple, let's hope we don't even bump. Oh, yeah. We just was to look at the mm -hmm. window and we caught a glance or a smile. Mm -hmm. That simple experience was a social interaction that allowed two perfect strangers on two maybe linear, literal linear paths meet for that moment. And I think in that way, it's, it's a very powerful image. And I remember one time in China, it was a really bad traffic day. And we were in some TV show and we we're in a bus. And there's like 30 of us in this bus getting carted around with police security. And we're going through it. Everyone's like kind of miserable. And there's this poor traffic guard just standing in the middle trying to like dictate people. And you can tell that they've been honked at for like a couple of yeah. days, hours, but they wore it on their face. And I remember we walked by and I said, hey, let's wave at her, mm -hmm. smile. So I was like 19, I just smile, wave. But that person broke out into the most wonderful smile. And I think that just that small, small, small social choice to say, how we can affect that person. I don't know that person today, but I remember that past person and it was a wonderful moment. So for me, that person still lives in that past. You know? mm -hmm. This is beautiful. Anyways, talk about your past and present versions of self. Yeah, well, Philip, thank you so much for giving me this interview, uh, sharing so much insights and also beautiful absolutely authentic coming from the heart personal experiences i value this a lot this already contributed to my understanding of the world and life and everything around so thank you for this gift hey, likewise thank you for the gift of being able to talk <laughs> and uh, anything we want to say to people maybe or the message that we want to send i think we send a lot of messages <laughs> Um, but no, I think everyone who's spending the time to tune in, I know that most of you might watch this on uh, playback mm -hmm. later. Um, and thank you for those that jump back three and forth times. Yeah. Different... yeah. Yeah. But, um, what can I say to you guys? I think let's just enjoy our life. If you choose to practice practice, if you choose to do jumps, do jumps, if you choose to, to stand in a post for one hour, go ahead and do it. But whatever you do it, do it with your full intensity and your full joy that was uh i had a quote in the past that if it doesn't interest if it interests your heart then it's not a waste of time may i also add how so i would just, call it let me hear do it because you love it because love is always enough that's right i think I it's it. basically the same 
you choose to do it. <laughs> have openness for other people's art. So we talk about that because we're a community. And I think to show the power of our quote unquote community and to endure through the generations, we have to continue to support one another and further develop ourselves. So let's try to do that. Like we're working together right now. Definitely, definitely. Well, Philip, have a nice, what is it, evening, day? Daytime. Daytime still. Have afternoon. a nice day. Thank you so much for giving me and so many others opportunity to hear you, your thoughts, and uh, hope to see you soon. In the in yeah, like after after the Corona virus situation. <laughs> if if it's an emergency, I'll come over with a bubble, okay. okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Have a good day. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs>